I didn't mean for my life, life to take that path. I don't think anybody of us does. I started discussing politics with my friends over beer on Friday and Saturday nights. Didn't think it could do any harm, you know? And so, before I knew it, I was discussing politics several nights a week with new friends I hadn't seen before. All of a sudden, I, I discovered myself reading a mid-term evaluation of the freedom of speech report from the Constitutional Amendments Committee. And politics crept in over coffee, it gradually took over my life. And here I stand, and having founded a political movement that has spread to over 60 countries and is actually shaping policy. And it can happen to anybody in this room. I used to wear jeans and a t-shirt. So, today's story. Copyright regime versus civil liberties. I'm Rick Falkvinge, spelled like this. And I love seeing my name on Twitter. If you have, if I'm saying something funny, if I'm saying something quotable, if I'm, if I'm just being plain boring, tweet about it. I love seeing my name on Twitter. Before we begin, a quick introduction. How many in here have heard of the Swedish Pirate Party? Let's see a show of hands. So I'd say that's about two thirds. That's, that's a good show. It's also fairly consistent. It's, con it's consistent enough that I put it in the slides, actually. No matter where I present in the world, that number is one half to two thirds. Whether it's in Japan, in San Francisco, here in Lisbon, or wherever. How, so just for kicks, how many have heard of any other Swedish political party? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> okay, there's usually one or two, but I don't see a single hand here. So isn't that kind of funny? And doesn't that tell you something about there's something very interesting happening in the underbrush right now. There's something very interesting going on about how the, ne how the next generation thinks about policy, thinks about what problems in society need to be solved. And perhaps most importantly, how the next generation picks its vote. Because these are all connected. I founded the first pirate party in 2006, known as Piratpartiet in, Sweden, in Swedish, spread to 63 countries at last count. We have elected representatives from seven on every level, from the European Parliament to uh, national parliaments in the uh, Czech Republic, to state parliaments in, in Germany, to local councils in several countries in Europe. We now have a new initiative called European Pirate Academy, which is a newly formed non-profit whose job it is to gather all the experiences and try to spread them across borders, packaging this experience about the cost efficiency we have. I mean, we beat all the established parties on less than 1% of their election budget. They still don't know what hit them, and it's been three years. We, the leadership methods used, which they don't comprehend. How can it, you just let anybody do anything and still call it leadership? Well, that's because it's pro about projecting trust. That's how you get stuff done. That's how you change the world. It's about communications. It is about organizational agility. And we try to communicate this to the rest of the world, primarily to corporations and governments. And there's also obviously a second thought about this, or there's an ulterior motive, meaning that if they learn to work in this way, motivated by cost efficiency as they may be, they'll understand what we're talking about. So, today's main attraction, copyright regime versus civil liberties. What is this deal anyway? I mean, what is the conflict between the copyright monopoly, and why am I even saying the copyright monopoly, 
and civil liberties. What is this monopoly? Where does it come from? What is its purpose? Because once you understand the history of it, you understand much clearer how we've got to the point where we are today and how nothing has really changed in 500 years. It's kind of depressing to hear, but it's true. History does repeat itself. Politicians are confused. The copyright industry, however, is anything but confused. They are die-hard cynical in order to get their way in more profits, more rent-seeking, and a short proposal on how to fix this. Why is there a conflict? Why is there a conflict? When our parents communicated, they used something called a letter, a physical piece of paper you would put, you would put in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and put it in a mailbox. I'm almost old enough to actually have used this. But this concept in the analog world came with certain properties. When you send a letter in the mail, or rather when our parents sent a letter in the mail, it had certain characteristics to it. First of all, it was anonymous. You and you alone determined whether you'd identify yourself as sender of this letter in the inside of the letter, for only the recipient to know, on the outside of the letter, for the entire world to know, or frankly, not at all. That was your prerogative, your prerogative alone, and it was considered a fundamental civil liberty to send anonymous letters. It was secret in transit. No politician would ever dream of suggesting that all letters would be opened just to see if they contained, contained something illegal. Well, nothing on this side of the, of the Berlin Wall anyway. That's what Stasi did, the East German Stasi. They would open all letters to see if they contained something subversive, if they contained something illegal. And who would object to that? It was only a matter of catching criminals, right? Well, no, wrong. That's the definition of a police state, that the police has any right to catch a criminal, that there are no civil liberties, no holds barred, and no rights for the citizen against the state. We have a tradition, dating back to the Enlightenment, that no police force has the right to open a letter just to see if a new crime is being committed. You can open a letter if somebody is under individual suspicion of a very specific crime. And it's serious enough, but no letter is opened to, to look for new crimes. That means you could freely copy any, poem, any poem, any drawing, anything, and send it in the mail. The postal services in Europe are still the largest distributors of narcotics narcotic substances, and nobody would dare hold them accountable for that. It's the endpoints that are. It's untracked. Nobody has the right nor the capability to see who's communicating with whom. And the mailman is never responsible for the contents of a message. Like I said, the postal, secret, the, the postal services are never responsible if somebody's sending narcotics. The people who are sending narcotics are, not the mailman. And here's the point. Here's the point. It is absolutely reasonable that our children have the same set of civil liberties, have the same rights when they are communicating in a digital environment as our parents had. There's no reason whatsoever these four rights should not inherit to our children. And that is entirely regardless whether somebody can no longer profit. Because when you, when you present this in, in a situation like Brussels or the European Parliament or European Commission, some representative from the copyright industry will, will stand up and be almost panting with anger and say, you can't seriously suggest that you, you'd allow anybody to send anything to anybody else. We couldn't make any money that way. And I'm just looking at them, shaking my head and saying, 
So what? <laughs> the, the job of an entrepreneur in any society is to make money given the current constraints of society and technology. No single entrepreneur gets to dismantle civil liberties, even if they can't make money otherwise. That is not how we determine what civil liberties are. We do not determine them based on who makes money and who doesn't. We base them on what our ancestors fought and sometimes bled and died to give us. And the copyright industry is not such an ancestor. We are, we are observing crackdowns on these four rights worldwide. And all the governments are introducing trackability, surveillability, wiretapability, and some kind of mailman responsibility, revoking the messenger immunity. And it's only the excuses that differ. This tells you something, that it wasn't about the copyright monopoly in the first place. It was about something else. The copyright monopoly is one excuse used here in what we would call the western parts of the world. It's one of four excuses that are used for surveillance of the net and crackdowns of the net. The other three are organized crime, narcotics, and typically pedophilia, and then file sharing. Any one of those four excuses is used to put people under warrantless surveillance, warrantless mass surveillance. In China, it would be morality and stability of the nation. In the Middle East, it's typically sanctity or the profit. But it's the exact same measures that, that are being taken. It's only the excuses that differ. This tells you something. It was never about the copyright monopoly. It was about something else. And we'll observe what that something else is. It is, con is, it, it is about control. It is about control of people th people's thoughts, but more so about control of what people see as true, about control of the narrative. If you want an example of how governments are cracking down on the net, you can easily observe that ex-president Mubarak, when people Oh, I missed a, a, a funny, funny part here in just how clueless politicians are. There was one law proposed in Arizona which would even make it illegal to annoy people online. <laughs> so they would essentially outlaw trolling. <laughs> Meaning that I couldn't go onto my favorite favorite fantasy forum or, or fan fiction forum anymore and tell about my latest trip to Lisbon and how great it was in Lisbon but on the on the airport on the way home I would see uh, I would see Fellowship of the Ring the Two Towers and Return of the King in a book stand in the bookstore on the air in the airport and I would go I would be all enraged about Hollywood's greed and how this majestic trilogy of Lord of the Rings had been made into a book and how they would not spare any expense on, how, on wringing greed out of these masterpieces. And then sort of bring a very big bowl of popcorn and watch the fireworks. <laughs> Politicians are seriously suggesting making stunts like that illegal. And that's kind of where the problem comes. <laughs> so. What is the copyright monopoly, and why is it a monopoly? You'll observe that copyright monopoly advocates don't use the word monopoly because it has a negative connotation. We observe, we think monopolies are generally bad things. So they don't use that. They, they use another word for it. And they use another word that is supposed to be positive, property. But it isn't property, and let me explain why. When we buy a chair, there are certain things we can do with that chair. First of all, this is just one copy of many of this chair. We have the receipt in hand. This is our property. We could take it apart and use it for new projects if we wanted. We could look at how it's made, and build an identical copy, and sell it. 
provided the chair is not protected by a patent monopoly, but the invention of a chair is safely older than 20 years by now, we can observe that we can even put it out on the porch and charge the neighbors to use it if they are stupid enough to pay for that. However, when we buy a DVD, same thing there. We have bought this copy. It is our property. It is one copy of a film out of many made from a master, master copy at a plant. Legally, it is our property. But there is a monopoly limiting what we can do with this property of ours. We may not take it apart and use the pieces for new, new projects of ours. We may not examine the patterns in the media, make a copy of it and sell it. And we may not use it on the porch and charge stupid neighbors to use it. That is because there's a monopoly that limits our property rights in what we have bought. This is very clear if you look at the American copyright monopoly law, which lists six specific items that are reserved for the copyright monopoly holder, regardless of whose property it is. So if you're looking at copyright monopoly lawyers as opposed to PR people, you'll observe that their language is very, very precise. They don't use PR language, they use precise language, they're lawyers. They don't say, we own this copyright. They say, we hold the exclusive rights to this audiovisual work. Exclusive rights is legalese for what's more colloquially known as a monopoly. A monopoly that limits property rights. Now, that does not mean that you can't defend the, mon the, the copyright monopoly for utilitarian reasons. There may be many reasons to defend the copyright monopoly, but you cannot defend it from the standpoint that property is good, because you'll end up in the opposite conclusion. And this is important as we, as we move ahead to understand that the copyright monopoly is in opposition to property rights and limits property rights. It's all a game of words, of course. Like I said, the monopoly advocates are using the word property because it's a, it's a, it is a positive sounding word. But it is factually wrong, 100%, 180 degrees wrong. It is a monopoly that limits property rights. And this comes from a history of control. When I speak to, and of sharing, by the way, because it, as we'll see, it, it's evident that our craving to share culture, to share knowledge with our friends, with strangers, with other people, and not just with people, with other, with other human beings and even others, aren't always, are, are very, very deeply rooted in us. Once on a t when you speak to sociologists about the net, they generally divide it into two groups. The first group will tell you that the net is the largest invention of mankind since the printing press 500 years ago, since 1453 specifically. The other group of sociologists will disagree with this and say that no, the net is the largest invention of mankind since the written language 6,000 years ago. That's how much it changes power structures. That's how much it changes our ability to, co to co cooperate. And to understand, put this in context, let's take, let's take a look at how the Catholic Church reacted to the printing press. Before the printing press, books were copied laboriously by monks who copied them by hand. This meant that there was a natural obstacle to spreading information that get, which was heavily controlled by anybody controlling the monasteries, essentially the Catholic Church. They saw themselves as the institution carrying the truth. Essentially, they had the role in society of educating people and telling people what was happening around them. Then came the printing press, 
allowing anybody to publish anything. Publishing ideas was a concept available to the middle class all of a sudden. And boy, did people publish things. They published ideas, novels, anything they could think of, discussions. The, equ the equivalent of our discussion forum was rampant when the printing press came. People would publish discussions and put, and put them on flyers and encourage people to discuss what was being discussed in their homes. And they did. Plagiarism was rampant. Reverse plagiarism was even more rampant, as in taking your piece and putting a famous author's name under it so it would actually be read by somebody. So how did the Catholic Church react to this? It was a huge problem for them because they were no longer the single news source. They were no longer the single news source. The concept of not just bad ideas, but wrong ideas from their perspective was a serious problem to society. So they went to the royalty across Europe and gradually prevented the printing press from being used. These penalties were gradually increased and increased and increased across Europe until in France on 13 January 1535 the penalty for using a printing press hit the death penalty by hanging. It didn't work. Even the death penalty did not deter people from copying. Our, ability, our urge to share ideas is that strong. Even the death penalty for copyright monopoly infringement or its equivalent for unauthorized copying does not deter people. So what do we learn? Well, the, there was a queen in England at this time who was known as Bloody Mary. Her father had been Henry VIII, who had had many mistresses and probably at least as many actual wives. And when the Pope didn't want to let him divorce his, was it first wife, Catherine? He responded by divorcing England from the church instead and founded the Church of England with a new bishop who would let us divorce his wife and move on to have eight wives in total. In, in sequence, for the sequence, though. Mary was, the, was his child from the first marriage, the Catholic marriage. She was kind of upset at the way her father had treated her mother, so she saw it as her task in life to make England Catholic again. But the printing press was a problem because it was able to distribute Protestant material. Her solution was not banning it. Her solution was to give a monopoly on printing to the London Guild of Printers, known as the London Company of Stationers, on, January, no, on May 4, 1557, in exchange for the Crown being able to censor anything they didn't want to see in print. This unholy alliance between capital and royalty was a very successful one to squelch and squeeze out freedom of express, expression, freedom of opinion. The printers got a lucrative monopoly on printing in exchange for the crown being able to prevent anything they didn't like from being printed. This monopoly was called copyright. It was created on May 4, 1557. This is not the history you hear from the copyright industry. And it is still around in, in various ways. It's been reshaped in many ways since. The original monopoly for, for printers has been expanded to cover books, book, commercial books, movies, computer programs, and what have you. And the key th lesson here is that this was about control of the narrative. This was about the ability to tell people what is true and what is false. Because you, if you hold that power, there's nothing you can't do. The Catholic Church never had to fear a law being made against their interest. They controlled the worldview of the legislators. They defined what was in the public interest. If you can define that, that is the greatest power you could possibly have. 
So this led to 200 years of war between Protestants and Catholic parts of Europe on the surface, but it went much deeper than that. It, what, this, what the religious wars were, were about on the surface was Luther protesting corruption in the Catholic Church. If you dive just a little deeper, it turns out that what the Catholic Church <coughs> protested against was printing presses being used to distribute Bibles in people's own languages. It was a disaster for the Catholic Church when France got Bibles in French, Spain got Bibles in Spanish, and Portugal got Bibles in Portuguese, because it deprived the church of being able to interpret Latin for the common folk. So what 200 years of wars in Europe were about was a lost gatekeeper position of information. Somebody had lost the ability to interpret the view of the world and, tell, and determine the worldview, determine the culture and knowledge available to the masses. We're in the exact same position today, and hopefully this won't end with 200 years of war. News was the same situation again when newspapers arrived. People, pro the academics who had previously set the agenda for society protested them loudly and said, who could possibly be interested in the opinions of the riffraff? It turns out that it was actually quite a good idea to listen to the everybody and not just a small elite. Same thing again in 1849 when public libraries arrived. The copyright industry went all out trying to prevent this from happening. Public libraries. They would say that you can't seriously allow anybody to read any book without paying first. No single author is going to be able to make a living writing, book, writing books if you open a public library. Public libraries across the nation. This was in England. No, if you do this, no single book will ever be written again. But Parliament, British Parliament at this time, was quite a bit wiser than parliaments today. They determined it was that public access to culture and knowledge, which was much, much more in the public interest than some middlemen's right to a penny every time a book was opened. So they opened public libraries in 1845, sorry, in 1850, and as we all know, not a single book has been written ever since. <laughs> Either that, or the same argument when used today is just as bogus. You've all heard it. If you allow file sharing, no, but nothing is ever going to be created ever again. It is just as bogus as when used 160 years ago. Nothing changes in this industry. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the other, what other problems the copyright industry has had over the years, shall we? They, they tend to say that the sky is falling every five or ten years with the advent of a new technology. So let's take a look at some of them. In 1905, the self-playing piano would be the end of a vivid, songful humanity, end quote. Gramophone, same thing. The broadcast radio, it would be the end of the record, the end of the record business. And they pointed out how in 19, uh, what was it? In 1929, record label sales had fallen from $75 million to just $5 million, and how, it, how this must be radio's fault, and they didn't even mention the Great Depression that happened to coincide with this. Loudspeakers would be the end of any orchestra, and this was a serious problem because this was, the, uh, this was when movies with sound appeared. Before you had had orchestras in, in theaters who were playing sound with every movie, all of a sudden lots and lots and lots of pro professional musicians would find themselves out of a job, and this was a serious problem. You'd even find professional musicians union that would argue some, that 
the state would go in and guarantee jobs for, music for musicians. It didn't happen. But it helps put today's so-called crisis where artists are getting more money in perspective. Television, ah yes. Who would possibly pay to see a movie when they could see it for free at home? This will be the end of cinema. We cannot possibly compete with free. Have you heard that one before? <laughs> Even more funny, a decade later, cable television. And when the television industry said, said the same thing, only in reverse. We have to, we have to provide... Death of the dance orchestra. Oh, am I, not, am I not coming across? Okay. Oh, I just realized that at the back you probably haven't heard the first half of my presentation. <laughs> Is there a problem with it? Okay. Testing one two, 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 okay. We're good again. Okay, let's try that again. Does anybody here not understand English? So 1970s, loudspeakers again. People actually proposed introducing a disco tax that would, that would go to these poor musicians that were being kept out of a job, being administered by some sort of copyright industry organization. You kind of laugh at that until you realize that this disco tax was, was actually introduced, and it is still around in many countries in Europe. The cassette tape, of course. Home taping is killing music. The Dead Kennedys, a band famous in, in the 1970s, actually put that slogan on one of their tapes. This was when cassette tapes were still being sold. Although they worded it quite differently. They said, home taping is killing record industry profits. And then added on the tape itself, we left this side blank so you can help. <laughs> Page two. <laughs> the video cassette recorder. Jack Valenti, then head of the Motion Picture Organization of Motion Picture Association of America, is famous for San famous for standing up to the US Congress and saying that the video cassette recorder is to the film creator as the Boston Strangler is to the woman home alone. The sky is falling. Digital audio cassette, a concept that never took off because mostly because the copyright industry was actually allowed to have a say in its design. So you weren't able to copy it. As a result, nobody wanted it. MP3, ah yes. The only reason to have an MP3 player is to steal. <laughs> the internet itself, 
was, was a real problem. Still is, obviously. And cloud-based music, in 2000, there was something called mp3.com. It allowed you to upload your own music, music that you had legitimately bought, and which could, which could then play anywhere. They had a system called pay, pay for Play, where people, well, artists could upload any music and royalties would be distributed using an advertising-funded model. So the more you listen to a particular artist, the more money they would get from the advertising. This was 13 years ago. 13 years ago. The record industry sued them out of, the, of existence, bought the rest for scraps, and just shut it down. Digital video recorders. Well, I could just go on and on. There's essentially, everything new is a problem. And the latest thing you heard from these, these guys is that they want to tax cloud storage. If you're buying storage capacity somewhere in the cloud, then you should be taxed for that because it could, it could be used to store music. I don't even know what to say. Actually, I do. The reason, they're getting, the reason they're asking for this time and again is because they're getting away with it. There's a very direct feedback loop between, between throw tantrums in public and get more money, which means that if they throw another tantrum and, and look absolutely let down five years later, they're going to get more money, tax money public money. No other entrepreneur has that privilege. There's no reason for the copyright industry to have one either. This monopoly has expanded massively in the past 20 years. It used to be only concerning commercial distribution of books mostly, then crept into music and movies. Today it starts concerning what honest people do in their own home, and that is not okay. It is now illegal it used to be that it just protected specific works. It now protects ideas and concepts. Fan fiction, sampling, and many other forms of culture are now illegal. If it weren't for this monopoly, we, would pro we wouldn't have seven Harry Potter books. We would pro probably have 7,000, most of which would suck horribly. But there would still be a gem or two in there. We don't have 7,000 because it's illegal for anybody but J.K. Rowling to write one. This is a real problem. The copyright monopolists tend to talk about, if you change this, talk, think about all the culture that will never get made. I'd rather think of all the culture that is illegal to make today and what a huge problem that is. The monopoly has essentially been hijacked by the industry's own interests, which leads us to the purpose of this monopoly. It is quite peculiar that most laws in every country in Europe have a so-called purpose statement as their first or one of the first paragraph saying, what is this law for? Why does this law exist? What is the goal of this legislation? The copyright monopoly doesn't. For some reason, it's just not there. We need to go to the, we need to go to another place to find the best worded, prop, uh, best worded purpose. But first, let's make clear that the purpose of this monopoly is not and was never to allow anybody to, to make money. Even though it's very nice to make money, it's a perfectly legitimate goal for an entrepreneur to make money, but there's no reason to legislate somebody's right to make money. If you do, you have a planned economy, and we don't have that. So if you go to the US Constitution, you find the a very clear wording on why this monopoly exists. To promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Did I hear wrong? Okay. 
to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And what this tells us is that the only reason for this monopoly's existence is to advance humanity culturally and scientifically. It is not for anybody to make money. It is not for anybody to even have a monopoly on making money. Those are the means. Those are the methods. They are not the goals. They were never the goals. If the means turn out to not support the goals, then we need to change the means and methods. So the copyright monopoly is a balance. And this is vital in understanding it. But the copyright industry would have you believe that it's a balance between the interests of the public and somebody's right to make money. That is not true. That was never, ever the case. The copyright industry is not a legitimate stakeholder in the copyright monopoly. They are a beneficiary of the monopoly. They benefit from it. Of course they do. But they are not a legitimate stakeholder. If you accept them as a stakeholder, that means they get a veto over the, what the monopoly looks like, and you can never look at what the public interest. The balance is between the public's interest in having access to culture on one hand, and on the other hand, the same public interest in having new culture created. Those are the two balances that, that need to be struck. In striking this balance, you hand out a commercial monopoly on the ability to make money. Now let's scratch that. It is not handing out an ability to make money. That's another misconception. It is an ability to prevent others from making money. That's what a monopoly is. You don't get a right to make money. You don't even get an ability to make money. What you do is to get a right to prevent others from making money. Which, if your idea sucks, is not going to happen in the first place. No entrepreneur has any kind of right to profit. So let's take a look at how, <laughs> how all of this has happened before. There are many funny stories about this. All of this has happened before, and probably all of this will happen again. Now, since you're at a technical university, you know that this is a quote from Battlestar Galactica, but that doesn't make it any less true. <laughs> when we look at control versus sharing, we can look at cotton fabrics in pre-revolution France. At that point, there was a new printing method for cotton fabrics, which were immensely popular to make dresses. The nobility and royalty noticed how popular these Print, this printing was with the common folk. And so the, the royalty and king started to sell monopolies on printing to nobility. This was for, for the king to make more money into the, the tax coffers and for the nobility to sell these fabrics very, very expensively. Guess what? People didn't care a bit. They copied everything they could. They printed everything they could. They loved making dresses out of these beautiful fabrics. So the nobility went to the king and said, we, you sold us this monopoly, you must enforce it. The commoners are copying without our authorization. Have you heard that one before? <laughs> and what happened, again, was that the penalties for copying dresses, for copying these fabrics, were gradually raised until they hit death penalty by torture, notably breaking on the wheel, which essentially means it's, it's a quite horrendous, horrendous form of death, actually. It means that every bone in your body is broken, and you're then weaved into a wagon wheel and left to, to die of thirst. Everybody, this was so common that everybody knew somebody who had been executed in this horrible way. And while the thought of this brings terrible, 
I don't, fr frankly, I don't feel good talking about it. I don't feel well talking about it. But the important thing here is that it did not stop copying. Everybody knew some, somebody that this had happened to, and it didn't even dent the copying. And that tells us something. The next thing we observe from vested interest is something called the Red Flag Act in Britain. When the steam engine arrived and people realized that this could actually be used to make an automobile, or it wasn't called an automobile then, it was called something else which was more understandable for the time. This was a great invention that everybody understood would totally revolutionize society. People loved it in general. They would go out of their way to, you know, like me, with any new invention that changes society like, right? They, just how people are generally, genuinely curious about it. Uh, and there's not, nothing lacking in how... Well, it doesn't work like that, as we know. The Red Flag Act of 1865 was a law limiting cars, limiting automobiles. It defined that any automobile must have a crew of three. It must have a driver. OK, I can live with that. It must have a stoker, which is essentially a machinist a mechanic in every car, and it must have a man walking in front of the car waving a red flag. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking, this was... The, this, was <laughs> the, the, this law existed. What this did was that it limited the practicality of the automobile to walking speed. It became a great tool for transporting people and cargo to stagecoach and railroad stations. But it prevented the automobile industry from ever becoming more practical. And it was several centuries until somebody actually dug down into what caused this law to happen and realized that these industries caused this law to happen. They would lobby, describe how this scared horses, scared people, and so you need a, a law limiting the use of the automobile to serving the incumbent industries. Again, as I started out saying, if you can control the truth, if you can control the worldview, there's nothing stopping you. As a result, Germany's automobile industry got a 30-year head start over that of the United Kingdom, something that the United Kingdom's automobile industry still has not recovered from. And that's still almost 200 years ago. So isn't there then a right to make money? Isn't there then, in the face of changing technology, some kind of protection for any entrepreneur? Well, let's look at another technology shift and see what happened then. Households were electrified about 100 years ago in Europe. It happened in 1920s, 1930s. Before then, the largest industry in almost every major European city was the ice-making industry, ice makers. They would go out onto frozen lakes in winter, saw out huge blocks of ice, store them on sawdust in barns, and then carry these blocks of ice to households, sell them to households, so that the households could keep food cold. Then, with electrification, came the refrigerator. The largest industry on the continent disappeared in five years, and still, Nobody suggested a refrigerator tax of 3,000 euros to go to the Ice Makers Union, did they? Because it, you could see that this was a technology shift. Once the households were electrified, the ice making industry was already obsolete. If you had make, made policy then to save jobs, 
you would have been counterproductive if you're making policy today to save jobs in an industry that's already obsolete. You're being counterproductive. Technology has always changed business models and probably always will. There's nothing strange about that. That's the way it goes. Nobody has the right to go into a courtroom and turn back clock to a time where they were, were profitable. Right, that was, there was that slide I thought about earlier. Governments are even more confused about this, which you, you can see about, which, which you can see on uh, the Egyptian ex-president Mubarak and how he reacted to the riots starting in Egypt. <laughs> if, you ever, if you're ever asked how internet contributes to democracy, you can point out how people who don't like democracy are responding to it. So politicians are confused about this. They don't, they're just completely lost. They really do not see this as an important issue. They don't understand why, is, why were they, there rallies in 200 cities across Europe against ACTA, a perfectly normal trade agreement. They generally do not understand it. They're too preoccupied with their the reason they were elected 20 years ago, which was energy policy, tax policy, health care, and so on and so on and so on. They do not understand that these issues are fundamental to not just one generation, but we're bordering on two generations. And yet politicians are still playing follow the experts. They're just listening to somebody who says that this should be done, and then they go, okay. That is a problem, in particular because the copyright industry is not confused. They understand exactly what needs to be done to safeguard their old monopolies and their industry. And they are doing exactly that. They may look confused, but they are not confused, they are just scared, and there is always money in the background. And when you start looking at this, you kind of lo lose a little bit of hope in humanity because it's so cynical you don't know where to start. I'm not going to give you three examples. The first example is from Ireland when the record industry there sued Aircom, Ireland's largest internet service provider, for the right to install wiretapping, switch, wiretapping equipment in their core switches. Rewording that, a private industry demanded the right to wiretap an entire population. I don't care what excuses they had, that's just plain unacceptable. It's beyond unacceptable, it's intolerable. And yet they are getting away with it. It gets worse. When I was at a Copyright Insiders seminar in, uh, in Stockholm in 2007. The chief of the Danish Anti-Piracy Bureau was there, Anti-Piracy Group, Johan Schluter. He took to the stage and said, my friends, obviously he didn't know we were there, my, <laughs> my friends, he said, politicians, don't understand why we have to filter the internet. That is a problem for us. But they understand why you have to filter out child porn. This is an opportunity for us. This is awesome. Because we need to help the politicians to censor and filter out child porn from the net. And in the next step, we can use this censorship to also filter out illegal file sharing. This kind of takes cynicism to a new level, doesn't it? This is how cynical these people are. They are seriously using abused children as an argument of why the government should go in and save their failed business. And not just that, if you want another layer on this, Child abuse survivors say that this censorship does not help them. 
it causes more children to be abused. The copyright industry does not care about that. They only want a foot in the door to create a censorship mechanism where they can start determining what people are allowed to communicate to one another. And as a third step, going back to where we started, they're trying to kill the letter. Like I said, the copyright industry goes outraged when you suggest that our children should actually have the same rights as our parents had. I don't think that's unreasonable at all. I really don't. But when you suggest that people should have the right to communicate privately, they protest and loudly and unfortunately they get the eyes of the politicians because they, the politicians, like I said, are, follow, are playing follow the experts. They are trying to introduce trackability. This mobile phone is now a governmental tracking device, much thanks to lobbying from the copyright industry who drove the data retention directive. They are introducing surveillability and wiretapability. Like I said, they even sued Aircom for the right to wiretap all of Ireland's population. They are very much trying to eliminate the messenger immunity, the mailman's immunity against anything that's in a letter, which essentially would turn the entire internet into a cable television network, because if you, if as a, a communications provider, you need to ask permission for anything that goes in your network, then you're not going to allow anything on your network. The messenger immunity is crucial to the legal functioning of the internet under our future economy. These three things are just examples of how cynical the copyright industry is and that they understand exactly what the internet is about. And more importantly, they understand how they need to destroy it to stay in business. The copyright industry is not afraid of seeing their copied music on YouTube. They are scared of seeing your music on YouTube. They are not afraid that you'll be able to copy books outside of a bookstore. They are afraid that you'll be able to publish books yourself and won't need them in the future. They are safeguarding a very privileged middleman position and they are literally fighting for their life as a business. They will spare, no, they will stop at nothing, nothing to kill the letter. Hence, copyright regime versus civil liberties. So how do you fix this? How do you fix the situation we're in? Three, three things. First, technical activism. You have lots and lots and lots of net liberty activists around the world who are creating tools to circumvent censorship. That can be used to circumvent the bans from the copyright industry as well as from dictatorships, which is why you're seeing this funny two-facedness from pretty much every government on the planet, praising the net in the foreign policy department but saying it's a problem in the Justice Department. Every government loves the net, but only for other countries. So technical activism is one thing that's needed. If you look at the Pirate Bay today, it looks like this. That's because the Swedish Pirate Party used to be the internet service provider to the Pirate Bay up until today. There was a threat placed by the um, copyright industry in Sweden. So, working as an international movement, the Pirate Bay is now hosted by, or rather provide a bandwidth by, not just one Pirate Party, but two Pirate Parties, the Norwegian and the Catalan one. And in the meantime, the copyright industry was left in the dust for, the, for another couple of years until they can figure that out. There are, there are 59 more Pirate Parties to go after these ones, so good luck with that. <laughs> Academic activism. 
These issues need to be explained at the academic level. They need to be re repeated over and over and over again how important they are and why there is a very direct connection between freedom of speech and the non-enforcement of the copyright monopoly. You cannot enforce the copyright monopoly and have free freedom of speech at the same time. You cannot. Any technical measure that has the ambition of providing freedom of speech must therefore make certain that the copyright monopoly cannot be enforced. This is the philosophy behind Freenet and similar darknets. And last but not least, political activism. One funny thing that I realized when founding the Swedish Pirate Party was that you don't actually need to take 51% of parliament to effect change, to create policy change. You only need to get politicians out of their follow the experts mindset. In other words, it's enough to start threatening to take their job. Once they start, once they start votes going, seeing votes going somewhere else than themselves, they get nervous. They get very nervous. And when politicians get nervous, that's when policy changes. You can change policy without a single seat in parliament if you're just making the politicians feel the heat under their feet. So there are five specific steps that we propose to fix this. First, turn the copyright monopoly back to covering commercial activity only. This is not rocket science. This is where we were 15 years ago, so it's perfectly feasible. That is, it is a problem that 250 million European citizens are participating in illegal file sharing on a regular basis. The copyright industry would like them to stop file sharing. The, we say it's a problem that the file sharing is illegal because we think it's a positive contribution to society. Limit the copyright monopoly term to a reasonable length. It is said that this monopoly, it's said, is uh, created to incentivize authors to give them a reason to write their next book after they've cr written a successful one. And that might sound reasonable, but this monopoly lasts for 70 years after their death. So I don't know a single author that keeps writing books after they are dead and buried. So this monopoly lasts at least 70 years too long. At least 70 years too long. And once you start going back that, going down that road, realizing that it's obviously at least 70 years too long, you can start discussing what's a reasonable length. 70 year, 20 years might sound long, but what it does is that it puts you in the reasonable camp on a, television, on a televised debate, where somebody who insists that it must last 70 years past the author, author's death is looking quite insane. Allow samples, remixes, etc. This was the case 20 years ago. We don't allow fan fiction any longer. It's illegal. We don't allow samples. It's illegal. We don't allow remixes. They're illegal. Fortunately, artists don't care about that. They never cared about whether they, the artist, whether the art they were making was illegal. They just made it because it's in human nature to create. We've created since we learned to put red paint on the inside of cave walls, and we are st still doing that. Kill various compensations. Like I said, the, the, the copyright monopoly industry has gotten away with compensations for any technical development they, that they can get away with being compensated for. I understand the latest thing in Portugal is that they should now be compensated because we buy USB sticks to store vacation photos. Obviously, vacation photos are a huge threat to the copyright industry, so they must be compensated for it and banning digital restriction mechanisms, DRM. This, uh, these kinds of mechanisms are essentially the copyright industry writing their own copyright monopoly laws. That's Parliament's job. Thank you very much. This is doable tomorrow. It has already gotten a lot of support in the European Parliament. It's, it's realistic. It's been taken up by the Green Group in the European Parliament, which is one of the major groups 
that tells you that this is a realistic proposal that is getting political momentum. And this would solve not the principal problems with this monopoly, but almost all of the practical problems. And we could start discussing what tomorrow's cultural landscape should really look like. We know that artists are doing fine. Households are spending as much money on culture today as they did before file sharing started. The only difference is that middlemen are making much, much less, which is great because that means artists are making more. So this proposal, allow and encourage non-commercial sharing, limit monopoly terms to 20 years, allow remixes, samplings, etc., kill various compensations, and ban DRM. That's a five-step plan, and if you want to read more about this, you can see it at www.copyrightreform.eu. We have a, published a book on the matter. It looks like, looks like this, the case for copyright reform. So one final observation here. It used to be that authority was sold. The ability to be heard was sold. The ability to tell what the truth looked like was sold. And that, that is because authority was controlled. The reason it could be controlled was that it was scarce. There wasn't enough to go around to everybody. That has changed. Today, everybody can publish their IDs to the entire planet in 10 minutes. That is fantastic. That is one of, one of the greatest achievements humanity has ever made. But it breaks the scarcity and therefore the controllability of authority. Authority has become abundant. And that leads us to another conclusion. Change doesn't just happen. Change doesn't just happen. Somebody makes it happen. And the question I want everybody to ask themselves thinking really deeply about this is, do you want to be that person? Do you want to be the person that causes change, that causes the world to change? Because that's where we started. Everybody in this room has the power to make that happen. And I'm hoping you'll want to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you all. So I understand we have a short break before panel discussion. Is that right? Thank you very much for coming uh, and uh, uh, If anyone has questions, I, I think uh, it's okay for asking questions to you. Sure. Okay. Anyone has questions? Hi. Um, I'd like to ask you two questions. Mm -hmm. So first, what is your thought of the LimeWire, lime uh, the fact that they sue LimeWire? I know they have a long way to do because they're much more uh, internet uh, downloads. I'm sorry, they're, they're suing Live? They, they sued LimeWire. They sued LimeWire. The oh, sued LimeWire, I yeah. hear. Okay. That, I, I would like to want your opinion about that. And about the um, artist's creations. Um, if you support this, if you don't support this copyright, how do you st distinguish creations? M what I mean is by, for example, someone's creates some kind of music or a painting or whatever, and I don't know, another bastard comes in and say, this is my creation. Oh, okay, how, how do you ascertain authorship? Yeah. Okay. So what do I think about the uh, lawsuit against LimeWire? The, it's, quite old by now, if I, I dare say that if we'd had the evidence today that, and be it been able, if we'd had the evidence today, that we have today, and been able to use it in that lawsuit, 
then things might have looked differently. Because we know today that file sharing does not hurt artists. It might hurt middlemen. And that's a good thing for artists. So LimeWire was essentially an infrastructure allowing people to share music. I see as fundamentally equivalent to the postal service. Going back to the fact that the postal service distributes, is the largest distributor of narcotics in every major European country. So suing LimeWire was a, was a way to create fear and prevent the net from taking on its full potential. It was a way to affect the copyright monopoly, not by going after those who actually shared music against the monopoly, but by going after those who made the infrastructure to make it possible. In that, in, in that sense, it has a lot to, in common with um, the, the legal massacre that, that was the uh, trial against the Pirate Bay 4 operators, or rather the two operators of Pirate Bay, its media spokesperson and the fourth unrelated person. Uh, second, how do we ascertain authorship? First, many people would ask, how do we make sure that people are paid when they create something? And that's not really a problem. That's not what you ask. I'm just bringing it up as sort of a target of opportunity here. That's not really a problem in a market economy. In Soviet Russia, you could do that. As in Vladimir Biletnikov, you look sturdy, you're going to be a builder all your life and get paid by the Bureau of Construction. Vladimir Dostoevsky, you look like you look like an artist. We don't understand a word you're saying. You're going to work as a writer all your life and be, be paid by the director of the incomprehensible arts. <laughs> it doesn't work like that in a market economy. If no politician has the duty to tell you where your next paycheck, paycheck is going to come from. That's up to, for everybody to find out. That said, we know that there are a lot of artists who are making a successful living as they're cutting out the middlemen who are trying to fight for their own existence. So the question is not how do we make sure artists get paid. The political question to solve is how do we make sure that enough culture keeps being created, which may or may not be answered with an answer involving money. Because it is a public interest to have more culture created. It is not in the public interest necessarily to give some sort of right to profit to an entrepreneur. The, uh, so going into how do you ascertain authorship? I don't really see that as a problem in the net age. There have been many cases of plagiarism and if, how many in here follow a site named Reddit? Okay, about one third. Essentially, whenever somebody posts a story to Reddit and it's been seen anywhere in the world before, it takes somewhere between three and five milliseconds before somebody stands up and screams, repost! <laughs> so, while it could be a theoretical problem, from what I observe, it's not a, it's not a problem in practice. Um, good afternoon. You, you spoke about um, a bill that uh, intended to charge for uh, cloud storage, mm -hmm. and you thought about a Portuguese law that um, was proposed to charge for storage, any kind of storage, not only Just cloud basics. storage, exactly. And that is a reality today, and people try to go through with laws like that. What, what do you think will happen in the future? How will this evolve? Do you think that will be a reality in a few years? Or will experience a political shift that will somehow prevent that from happening? OK, so I'm uh, answering this on three levels. The first is an observation that values in society are shifting. There are surveys done of the values of 17-year-olds, and those are done every 10 years. For the survey done, 
I think it was three years ago now. Anyway, the most recent survey on, on the values of 17-year-olds across the continent saw sustainability drop from the first position for the first time in several decades. Something else had taken the top position on the minds of 17-year-olds, and that was openness and free speech. And the reason this is so interesting is that the values of 17-year-olds tend to stick with them for the rest of their lives, and they pick their political preferences from their values. So long term, I see this as being a precursor to a major political change. Second, how long will this go on? It will go on exactly as long as the copyright industry gets away with it. They'll probably get this tax now, and in another two or three years, they'll come back and want to tax something more, because this is free money to them. They're getting money for nothing. Of course they want it. I would want it, wouldn't you? If I can just lie down here and scream at the top of my lungs for a day or two and get free money for the rest of my life, of course I'd lie down and scream. And I'd do it again in five years to get more money. So as long as they can get away with it, they are going to keep doing it. It's a, it's a very positive reinforcement mechanism. What, which brings me to the third part of the, the answer. What we need to do to stop this is to point at the consequences of it. We need to point at the consequences of poor, struggling artists being for to pay, forced to pay the rich ones. We need to point at how a single mother of two is forced to pay 30 extra euros for a games console. Yes, this tax extends to games consoles in Sweden as well, which is not fair anywhere. We need to point at the real-life effects on poor, struggling people and point at how money is actually going to rich lawyers and how deeply unjust, immoral, and I'd say offensive that is. Did that answer your question? Thanks. Um, I, I have a question too. Mm -hmm. um, actually, two questions. Um, first, um, we have seen a lot of uh, re uh, situations recently um, with uh, patents, uh, mainly software patents, in mm -hmm. which uh, various companies patented, for example, situations of uh, using a single button to buy something, or, for example, patenting the behavior of the page down keyboard button. Um, and even many companies that simply work and exist only to patent things. Uh, what is your opinion on these, um, on these, uh, on the situation of the patent uh, mono monopoly? I think patent monopolies are even worse than copyright monopolies, and I think they need to go as a whole. The uh, patent monopolies are an even worse limitation of property rights because the copyright monopoly at least limits what you can't copy. You need to make a personal observation of this particular bottle of water, and you're not allowed to make a copy of it. With a patent monopoly, you're not allowed to create a bottle from scratch. If somebody on the other side of the planet, one of seven random billion people, happen to have, have the same thought as you have ever before in the, in the previous 20 years. That's absurd. It limits... It, it's said that patent monopolies encourage innovation and encourage entrepreneurship. Every piece of empiric evidence we've seen indicates the exact contrary. It limits entrepreneurship. It is a means for incumbent rich industries to kill innovative upstarts because those are the only ones who are, can afford to play the, the patent monopoly game to begin with. And one needs to remember that a patent monopoly is a ban on innovation. It forbids everybody but the patent monopoly holder to use this invention and build on it. And for such a mechanism to actually incentivize more innovation and create more innovation, you have to prove a lot of positive side effects beside this direct ban that the monopoly is. And frankly, every time you take it to the test, such side effects turn out to not exist. I could go on at, 
I could go on easily another hour about this. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, where are you? Oh. Here. Uh, nowadays, movies are extremely expensive to make, mm -hmm. and with advertising, the creator can actually get money without the person who is watching paying anything directly. So when we watch TV or even with some YouTube videos, it is possible for that to happen. But when people use file sharing and torrents and things like that, uh, the creator isn't getting any money to pay for what they, what the expenses that they had producing the movie. So what do you feel about that? What should we do? Right. So essentially, how can we make sure that big hundred million dollar movies keep getting made if we allow rampant free file sharing? Is that, would that be summarizing your question? Yes. Okay. There are two answers to that question. The, f the first is the observation that changing the laws as suggested here would be correcting the map to match the landscape. 250 million Europeans are already file sharing on a regular basis. We know what a, a movie producer would make tomorrow if we legalize this, because it's the exact same number as they make today. The other observation is that you could argue that there's a theoretical possibility that no single movie will ever be sold again if we allow this, just like no book has been written since 1849. And no, people, people do bring up this argument, so I want to counter it. You didn't say this. I don't want to be, I don't want to be impolite towards you. It's, it's me painting a straw man here. So what you can observe is that the, the biggest blockbusters are making their investment back on opening weekend. On opening weekend. What does that mean? Well, it means that the, the investment is made back at a profit before the, a digital copy can physically exist on a file sharing network. The biggest movies make their entire investment back and make a profit before it is physically possible for a copy to even exist on a file sharing network. So I don't see this being a big problem because you can observe that even if nothing was sold after the first copy went wild, the big movies we want to still be made are still making a profit. Did that answer your question? Sort of. Well, if you have independent movie makers, then they have a, uh, the net is the greatest thing that could ever happen to them. Because it used to be that, let's compare with music, and I'll go, go back to movies. I always find it funny how people defend the copyright monopoly with the argument, how will the artists get paid if you change, if, if you d dismantle this monopoly? Because the middleman structure actively makes sure that 99.95% of artists never see a single cent in royalties. And I am not making that number up. About 1% of artists ever get signed with a record label. That's, that's getting the 99% away. Actually, I was wrong. It's not 99.95%. It is 99.995%. Out of the ones that do get signed up with a record label, only 1 in 200 ever see a cent in royalties. So I find it absurdly funny that somebody would actually defend the copyright, defend the middleman situation with the argument, how will the, the, how will the artists make money if you change the structure? The obvious retort is, well, 
99.995% of artists are not making a cent in royalties under your system. Don't you think how will the artists get money is a little funny argument from your side? So going to independent filmmakers, we can observe that there are many, many, many ways to get funding today that don't use these middleman structures that don't require the copyright monopoly, that don't use any kind of lockdown on cultural knowledge. The most famous example is probably Kickstarter, where movie projects regularly today get budgets of 100,000 euros and plus. You had TPB AFK, which was released fairly recently, which was crowdfunded to a large extent. And I'm not saying that this is the solution. It is not my job as a politician to find the solution. Like I said, it's not the politician's job to, to say where the next paycheck is coming from. What I observe, however, is that people are finding solutions, that independent movies are being made. And more importantly, nobody has the power to, to tell a creator that they can't publish. That time is gone, and I'm happy that it is. OK? Thank you. OK, just uh, time for one last question. Further questions can be asked at the discussion panel. So last question. Um, it has come to my attention that there is a bit of a divide on um, the legitimacy of um, file sharing between the United States and Europe. Uh, it is. It is my opinion that in Europe, uh, file sharing is much more uh, accepted in the general public. Everybody frowns about it when we, uh, we hear opinions from the United States. So let's say that in Europe, file sharing would actually be made legal mm -hmm. and uh, general practice. Uh, wouldn't that create a divide between what happens in the United States and Europe and uh, what would end up happening is people in Europe would just pirate everything that comes from the United States and. Um, I don't know, um, end up ignoring what is created in Europe and thus uh, creating negative effects on um, the content that is produced actually in Europe? Uh, if, I were to answer, if I should answer this question properly, I, it would take several hours. But because you're, you're going into the real global politics behind this monopoly game. You're going into the real global power game and the game of global economic domination. And that's what it is. If you want a, a, a tangible example of just how much global power is vested in this, you can look at uh, Russia's as accession to the World Trade Organization, when the United States and Russia, former mortal enemies at nuclear gunpoint, who had held each other at a hair trigger, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, would sit down at the negotiating table and discuss Russia's term for accession into the World Trade Organization. The United States could have gotten away with asking anything, demanding anything. What they demanded was that Russia would close the record store, all of mp3.com, which was a radio station under Russian law but was selling MP3 files under US law. Two former, the co two Cold War enemies at the negotiating table, and the United States demanded that Russia close a record store. That puts things in perspective. And what would happen? Well, the European Union is the world's largest economy. The United States is blissfully ignorant of this fact, but the, United, the European Union is the world's largest economy. Any monopoly is dependent on everybody agreeing to it. If the world's largest economy says that this monopoly is no longer in our interest to uphold, we are going to stop doing so, then frankly, nobody else can do a bit about that. They can, tr they can threaten trade sanctions, they will threaten trade sanctions. They will probably even impose some trade sanctions. But as long as it's in our long-term interest to be economically independent, we're not going to care about that. 
being the being the world's largest economy also brings you certain benefits because trade sanctions only work against a smaller economy. That's why the United States can impose a trade sanction on Cuba, but Cuba cannot impose a trade sanction on the United States. So, that, so if you, the United States actually imposed trade sanctions, it would hurt them more than the European Union. I think that was the last question. Did I get that right? So we're taking a break and then reassembling at the panel? That's right.